Welcome to Karis Daily Live Bible Study. Join believers from around the globe to study the Bible with Andrew Womack and instructors from Karis Bible College. Well, good evening. My name is Daniel Bennett, and today we're going to talk about how to be free from stress and fear. Uh, before that, though, I have a couple quick announcements. I'm going to set a world record for announcement speed right now. Uh, I'm hosting myself, so I'm going to do, do, do the announcements and jump right into it. So uh, we're still doing Q&A. If you have questions, if you're watching live, you can ask your questions. I'll answer as many as I can at the end. Also, if you need prayer or if you would like to become a partner or donate, uh, become part of this ministry, you can call 719-635-1111 or you can go to our website, awmi.net. Uh, that's it. Okay, let's jump right into this. So, uh, like I said, my name is Daniel Bennett. I'm the Executive Director of Academics here at Karis Bible College. And I find a lot that stress and fear, and I know there's many types of fear, um, can really take away from our enjoyment of life. And really, and I don't mean every form of fear, but more the fear connected to stress, uh, being overwhelmed, things like that. I find that a lot of people, they miss out on how awesome life can be and how much fun they could be having. Um, if they're walking in stress and fear, because really it just makes everything worse. And so I want to give 10 different ways to be free from stress and fear. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to it. If I don't get through all of them, then I'll just finish it tomorrow. So actually I'm sharing tomorrow also and Monday, I believe, unless anything changes. So first of all, before we get to the 10 points, is that life is so much greater than darkness. Right? Life and light is so much, you know, light is better than darkness. Life is better than death. They're not equals. Right? Life actually swallows death, right? It's so much greater than it that it completely destroys it. And, and I want to start with 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 4. So it says, For we who, are, we who are in this tent groan, being burdened, not because we want to be unclothed, but further clothed, that mortality may be swallowed up by life. And I love that image right there, mortality being swallowed up by life, right? Death was never supposed to be part of, the, part of our experience, and life is so much more powerful. See, what happens a lot is a lot of people believe that light and dark are two equal forces, right? God and the devil are two equal forces. They're not equal at all, right? Light completely destroys darkness. God is, the devil's not even close. He's not God's equal. There's not some battle in the spiritual realm of two equal opposing forces fighting for supremacy. God has all the power, right? And that's the whole reason why God couldn't interact with us before Jesus. He had to, he had to keep a distance from us because he's so holy and we were in darkness that if he got too close to us, we'd be vaporized, right? We'd be completely destroyed. That's why, right, when God's meeting with Moses on the top of the mountain, everyone else was terrified. Because if you're in darkness, then the light will completely destroy you. And out of God's mercy, he kept a distance until he could come as Jesus to save us. And so light is so much more powerful. So what does that have to do with stress? Well, my first point before I get to the 10 points, but my first uh, introductory point is that I'm going to share 10 different tips, but you don't need all 10 of them, right? If you're in a room that's pitch black and there's 10 light bulbs in that room, you don't need to turn all of them on. If you turn on just one of them, the room is now bright, right? You've now pushed out darkness. It's gone. You only need one of the 10. Now, if you turn on two, three, four, if you turn on all 10, it just gets brighter and brighter. So it's great if we're walking in more than these, but I'm not encouraging you to try to focus on 10 different things. That might even cause more stress, right? That'd be ironic if you listen to a how to be free from stress thing and you end up becoming stressed out about it. Um, I know I've listened to teachings on healing where it's like 20 reasons not, uh, why you might not get healed. And then you, by the end of it, you're like, I'll never get healed. My goodness. That's, you know, so I'm not trying to do that to you. So again, life is so much more powerful that if you just get one of these, if you just start walking in another level in any one of these, um, you, you will be free from stress and fear because each one of these can, can, get, can get the job done. God is so much more powerful. So I'm going to look at 10 different things. First of all, though, what is stress? What do I mean by stress? A basic definition of stress is a state of mental tension caused by a difficult situation, right? So it's there, there's a tension there. It's something's got to give. There's too much going on that, that you can handle. Um, usually it's caused by two things. Usually there's a desire that you have and there's something in the way. Right? So maybe you want to do something and you don't have enough time, or you want to buy something, you don't have enough money. You want to spend time with somebody, but they're not available, right? It's, it's basically a form of lack. It's I want something and I can't get it, um, and therefore I'm stressed out about it, right? Maybe some examples, maybe you need to make a decision and you wish you had four days to think about it, but you only have 30 seconds, right? That could, that could be a cause of stress. Uh, maybe there's three things you need to do and you only have time to do one of them. That could be a cause of stress, right? If anybody is a... Um, 
a parent, right? Sometimes you're in that situation, right, where you're like, I'm trying to cook and clean and take care of the kids, and all three of them are full-time things, and how am I supposed to juggle all of this at the same time? So that could be a form of stress when you're trying to do more things than you have time for. Um, it could also be, you know, you're trying to get something done and something goes wrong, right? So say, for example, you wake up a little bit late, so that goes wrong. You, you get ready just in time. Say you have an important meeting or an important class or something like that, you have to go take a test. And say so you, you rush out the door, you barely make it on time, and your car breaks down, right? That could be a cause of stress where you want something and something is in the way of that. So that's kind of what I'm talking about. It's not always just an obstacle. So usually it's, if there's an obstacle and you have all the time in the world, that's not always stressful. Usually it's that things are happening so fast and all at the same time, and that can cause a form of stress, a form of fear, um, where, where you feel like I won't get what I want. Things are gonna go wrong, something like that. And that is no, that's no fun way to live. That's not how God wants us to live our lives. So uh, let's move on here. Like I said, you only need one of these. Don't be stressed out um, when I talk about 10. And for all I know, I'll only get through five of them. And I'm not stressed one bit. We'll just move on till tomorrow. So the first one, some of these will be really, really quick. Some of these might be a little bit longer. Um, but I just want to show you all the different ways that you can be free from stress. Not all of them, so many of them. There's, I could go on and on, but we'll just do 10. First one is love. A revelation of God's love is all you need to be free from stress. All right, 1 John 4, chapter eight, or verse 18. So 1 John chapter 4, verse 18 says, There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear, because fear involves torment. But he who fears has not been made perfect in love. Right, fear involves torment. I didn't, I didn't, you know, again, fear, stress, similar things, right? is that if you're walking in fear, if you're walking in stress, being overwhelmed, that's, that's torment, that's not fun, that's not what God has for us. Perfect love casts that out. So if nothing else, right, if you have a revelation of God's love, you can walk in amazing peace and freedom because you're, you know, you don't even have to understand it, right? It's not even like the situation has to change. You're just like, I don't feel that anymore because I'm such a revelation of God's love for me. You know, basically what happens is that when people are stressed out, usually it means that they have tunnel vision on the situation that they're in right now, right? So things are going all, all crazy right around me. And so if we back up and look at the big picture and we're like, wait a minute, wait a minute. This is just one situation right now. If I back up, God is still God. He still loves me. I'm still loved. I, you know, he's got my back. He, it's his grace, not my own strength, right? If you back up and, and you know, again, focus on that revelation of God's love to you, God's love through you, it changes how you look at the experience. So I want to give an example of this with Martha, um, one of my favorite women in the Bible, favorite people in the Bible. Luke chapter 10, starting in verse 41, Jesus answered. So Martha went to Jesus and said, Jesus, my sister's not helping. She was stressed out and frustrated. Jesus answered and said to her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and troubled about many things, but one thing is needed. And Mary has chosen that good part, which will not be taken away from her. I see Mary chose Jesus. And it doesn't mean that no work had to get done. But, but Jesus would have led, you know, Jesus would have taken care of things. If Martha had chosen Jesus, she wouldn't have been stressed out and worried and frustrated and angry. He's like, no, Mary did the right thing. She chose me. And again, if you only get one of these, this is the best one, right? It's this revelation of God's love and saying, he loves me. I love him. Everything else will sort itself out if I just am focused on God. He'll lead me in what to do. He'll give me the grace for what I need to do. He'll give me wisdom. He'll give me direction if I just focus on him. And so, again, you might say, what about the situation, though? I mean, if I just sit around saying God loves me, nothing's going to change. But that's not true, because God's love is not just an emotion, right? God's love actually changes a situation. God's love is powerful. God's love actually changes things. It's not just, oh, just sit around while the world burns down around you. It's, no, I have peace. And now that I have this peace, I can focus on what God's leading me to do in the situation. So God's love is powerful. Number two is humility. I've touched on this before. If you've ever heard me share in the past, I, I mentioned this one pretty regularly. Um, but it's humility to cast your cares onto Jesus. So let's look at 1 Peter chapter 5, verses 6 and 7. He says, Therefore humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, that he may exalt you in due time. Right? So humble yourself, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So it is humility to cast your care on Jesus. It's actually pride to hang on to your own cares. If you're worried about something, you're in pride because you're saying, I will be my own God. I can handle this. I will worry about this because God's not worrying about it. I need to take care of myself because I think God won't take care of me. So you're basically saying, I'm God. And that's very proud. So if you, again, this is all you need. Just humble yourself and say, whatever I'm stressed out about, whatever I'm worried about, 
It's as simple as saying, uh, I'm not God, you are. I'm going to humble myself and cast my cares on you. I don't know how we're going to do this. It's okay. My own worry won't give me the strength to do it, but my humility will. And there's another reason why humility is so great. So it's not just saying I don't want to be proud, but James 4 verse 6 says he gives more grace. Therefore, he says God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Right? So any situation you have, grace is the solution. If you have more grace, then you have everything that you need. And so how do you receive grace? Well, it says he gives grace to the humble. Humility is how we receive grace. Pride is how we push ourselves away from grace, right? It says God resists the proud. I mean, can you imagine you have a, a situation and you think that by stressing out, you're making it better when actually that's pride. And now God's resisting you because he can't give to someone who's in pride. He's trying to give us grace. He's trying to let his gr grace flow through us. But we need to be humble to receive it, because if we say, I'm God, then he's like, my grace doesn't work if you're God. My grace only works if I'm God. And so humble, humble yourself, and you'll receive grace, and that will help you solve the problem. So uh, let's move on to number three. Focus. What are you focused on? So one of my favorite scriptures for this is Isaiah 26, verse 3. Isaiah 26, 3 says, you will keep him in perfect peace, perfect peace complete peace, whose mind is stayed on you because he trusts in you. No matter what's going on, we can have perfect peace if, we, if our mind is on God, right? So he will keep us in perfect peace if our mind is stayed on him. And that's just amazing. So if we stay focused on him, if we stay aware of him, and these all kind of tie together, I'm saying 10 different ones, they all pretty much overlap. But if we keep our mind on God, we'll be in perfect peace because we're like, God's God. And look at the promises he's given me and look at the love and the grace and the power that he's given me. And so everything will look different. We won't be stressed out. We'll, we'll have a different attitude about things. So what are we focused on? Uh, similar, you know, still talking about focus, Philippians 3, or sorry, Philippians 4, verses 8 and 9. You know, what are we, what, fo what we focus on affects what's inside of us and what's happening in our soul. So, um, here Paul says, finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, Whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there's any virtue and if there's anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you have learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. So again, it's very interesting, right? We're talking about being free from stress and fear, saying the God of peace will be with you, but do this, meditate on things that are pure and holy and lovely and praiseworthy. So many times when we're not walking in peace, it's, it's basically the opposite of thanksgiving and praise. Instead of thinking about things we're thankful for and, re, and reminding ourselves of what God has done and praising Him and thanking Him and, and um, getting excited, right? Stirring up, reminding ourselves of testimonies. Remember last time that God did this. Remember last time God did that. If we focus on negative things, we're just stirring up things that cause fear. So he's saying focus, focus on things that are good and pure and lovely and amazing. Don't focus on all the negative things. You don't have to sit down and think, what are the 10 ways things could go wrong? You know, what could possibly happen right now? Um, and so if you want to walk in peace, focus is one of the keys. If we focus on evil, if we focus on bad news, if we focus on lies, then we're, we're setting ourselves up to be full of fear and stress. So number four, and this is a huge one. I'm just going to barely touch on it. Uh, one of you asked in the comments for me to talk about the fear of the Lord. So I'm, I'm including this here um, for you. So Psalm, or this one, number four is the fear of the Lord. And Again, maybe some other time I'll give a full breakdown of this, um, of kind of how I explain the fear of the Lord. But the, the short version of this is awareness of how awesome God is. It's not being afraid of Him. It's being in awe of Him. It's being ama amazed and saying, wow, you're so much bigger than me. You're stronger than me. You're kinder than me. You're holier than me. And just when we truly appreciate how awesome He is, right? You can look at John when he saw Jesus in the book of Revelation, right? When Jesus was in His earthly body, John was very comfortable with him, right? He asked, can I sit at your right hand? And he laid his head on him and he had no problem. But when he saw him the way he really is, he fell down on his face as though he were dead, right? That's the fear of the Lord. It's realizing, wow, you're amazing. And it changes everything because when you realize how awesome God is, then when you realize, oh, he loves me, now his love is so much more powerful. He's not just some teddy bear who loves you. He's an awesome, powerful, terrifying God who loves you and is kind and is good to you. And so a couple of scriptures on this, that's a, I could go on and on, but uh, maybe I will in the future soon. But Psalm 27 verse one says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? 
Right? The Lord is my strength, is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? Right? So again, if you see God for who he really is, why would you ever be scared of anybody else? He's so much bigger than any problem you could ever face. Right? When David saw Goliath, he wasn't afraid because he's like, I fear God. He's amazing. When I look at this guy, he's nothing. And so if you, if you fear God, if, you, if you're in awe of God, not afraid of God, if you're in awe of God, then when you look at other problems, you'll say, why would I be afraid of this? Because God's got my back, right? I mean, Romans 8, 31, this next scripture, he says, what then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? Right? If you know how awesome God is, why would you ever be afraid of somebody else, of some other situation? Because you're like, man, that, the strongest being in the universe, the God of, who created the universe is on my side. He loves me. He's forgiven me. He's glorified me. He's made me his child. He's given me, the, you know, everything that he has. He's made me a joint heir with Christ. He, he's amazing, right? Why would I be afraid of this situation right now? So again, it changes our perspective, which changes how, how we do in life. So number five. This is very simple, but you can ask God for peace, right? It sounds simple because it is. Just ask him. If you need peace, just ask him. Instead of worrying and stressing, say, God, I just need some peace right now. All right, Philippians 4, verses 6 and 7, Paul says, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, so asking, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. See, sometimes you just need supernatural peace. And here he says, it's not wrong to ask for it. Just with prayer and supplication, let your request be made known to God. God, I need this. I'm asking you for peace. Just ask for it. And sometimes your brain, see, I love that it says your peace that passes understanding. Because sometimes your brain, it says, I can't have peace unless I understand why I should have peace. But God can go beyond that, where he says, you don't even have to understand it. I'm just going to give it to you anyway. Where you can look at your situation and say, nothing's actually changed yet. But I have peace. I don't understand why I have peace. That's kind of like the, the gift of faith, right? We're like, I have faith. I don't know why I have faith. It's just, I, I just know that I know that I know. It's a similar thing. It's, it's actually the same thing. I just have perfect peace. And now that you're in perfect peace, you can hear God more clearly. You're, you're receiving grace. You're, you're, God's giving you direction on what to do, things like that. And so now you can switch from focusing on the problem to um, God showing you what to do about the situation to solve it. See, and the goal is not just to say, my emotions are fine, let everything fall apart. It's no, I'm, I'm walking in peace and freedom from stress so that I can hear God and actually solve the problem and actually do something about this. So again, that's very simple. But the thing is, is that when you ask God for peace, what are you doing? You're humbling yourself because you're saying, God, you can, I can't. That's a great thing to do. And you're also focusing on him, right? Those are two things we already touched on. So you're focusing on him when you ask for something, you're humbling yourself. So these are all tied together. So number six. I think I'm making good progress here uh, as far as the time. So power, when you have power, why would you be afraid if you're incredibly powerful? So 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, I love this scripture. For God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I, this is one of the first scriptures I learned growing up. And I always focused on God hasn't given us a spirit of fear. So if I felt afraid, I'd say, God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. God hasn't given me a spirit of fear. And as I got older, I realized, wait a minute, I'm missing out on the best part. He gave me a spirit of power and love and of a sound mind. It's like, am I living life walking around with a spirit of power? It's not, just that he didn't, it's not just that he didn't give us fear. It's that he gave us power and love and a sound mind. He gave us something amazing that completely overshadows the lack of fear, right? It's one thing to just say, I don't have fear right now. It's even better to say, I have power. The reason I don't have fear is because I can walk in power, right? See, a simple definition of power is the ability to get results. If something's powerful, it means that it works. It gets the job done that it's trying to get done. And so if you're walking around with a spirit of power, it means I'm walking around in a spirit of I can get things done. I can get results, right? I, right? Uh, I'm more than an overcomer. And so, you know, instead of thinking of yourself as a victim and saying like, ah, oh, woe is me, look at the situation that's going on, you can say, I'm not a victim, I'm the hero. I walk around with the spirit of power. Again, if, if a normal person sees some emergency, they might get scared. But if Superman sees some kind of emergency, he's like, I can go fix that. I'm not scared. I'm going to run right to it. So when you have a spirit of power, it completely changes how you approach things in life because you're like, no, I've got everything that I need. Right? I've got the word of God. I've got God's promises. I've got the spirit of God with me. I've got the Holy Spirit with me. So I, I can do things about this. And so why would I be afraid? 
Like I said, if this is the only one you get, it's still more than enough to never walk in stress or fear when you have a spirit of power. Um, a, a quick example with this, you know, in the Old Testament, I don't have time to fully break this down, but in the Old Covenant, the Ark of God, the Ark of the Covenant carried the presence of God. And the Ark of the Covenant, one time David had to drop it off in somebody's house. He wasn't able to take it. So 2 Samuel chapter 6, verse 11 um, and verse 12 says, The Ark of the Lord remained in the house of Obed-Edom, uh, the Gittite, th for three months, and the Lord blessed Obed-Edom and all his household. Now it was told to King David, saying, The Lord has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that belongs to him because of the Ark of God. And I'll stop there. But see, what I'm showing here is the Ark carried God's presence, and wherever God's presence went, God was able to bless and do amazing things. And in the New Covenant, it's not an Ark in one location in a temple. We're the temple of the Holy Spirit. If you truly had a revelation, and you may, but the more we walk in the revelation of the fact that my body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, I carry God's presence with me. God's presence can, can do miracles. God's presence can meet every need, can, can bless the people around me. Everywhere I go, right? Wherever I work is blessed because I work there. Everywhere I live is blessed because I live there. You know, anybody who blesses me is blessed. You know, and when you have that revelation that I carry the presence of God with me wherever I go, right? If I walk into a dark place, I'm not scared of the darkness. I say, no, I'm going to change the atmosphere. I'm carrying God's presence into the situation. Why would I be afraid? Right? Jesus never walked into a room and said, oh, my goodness, too many demons. That's ridiculous. Wherever he went, he was himself. Right? I'm, car I'm carrying God's presence wherever I go. And so he never had to be afraid of the darkness around him. So God has given us a spirit of power, and that can completely set you free from stress and fear. So number seven is joy. And I talked about this um, recently, so I won't go too in-depth. But Nehemiah 8, verse 10, the second half of that, says, The joy of the Lord is your strength. Right, the joy of the Lord is your strength, right? Imagine doing something without strength. That's what it's like to do things without joy. If you're trying to do something and you don't have joy. So I've learned no matter what God calls me to do, I know that I can do it with joy because he would never call me to do something without him. And if he's with me, I can have joy. And joy is actually how I do it. If you have joy, you have strength. Now, if I have strength, I can do it. So there's no need to be afraid. No need to be overwhelmed or stressed out if I'm full of strength. It changes our situation. You know, two people can look at the exact same situation and one can be full of stress and the other can be full of excitement. It's completely dependent on what's inside of us is how we look at a situation. And so joy changes how we look at situations because we're looking at it from a position of strength and we're saying, I can do something about this, right? It's like if somebody's riding a bicycle and they barely know how to ride and they see something in the way, they're like, oh no, oh no, and then they crash and fall over. But if somebody's an amazing bicycle rider, right, and BMX, you know, ex export kind of professional, right, they might see that same obstacle and they say, oh cool, I can do a trick. Like they, they look at the exact same thing and one sees an opportunity to do something cool, the other one sees terror. And so joy can totally change how we live life. Uh, number eight is to be a doer of the word, not a hearer only. So Matthew 7, verses 24 and 25. He says, therefore, whoever hears these sayings of mine and does them, I will liken him to a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rain descended and the floods came and the winds blew and beat on that house and it did not fall for it was founded on the rock. I see in this world, we're going to have storms. Jesus didn't say, if you do what I say, there will be no storms. He said, if you do what I say, your house will be on the rock. So when the storms show up, it won't, it won't shake you. It won't bother you. You can be inside, right? And uh, here in Woodland Park, right, we, can, we had snow today, I think, or yesterday, I forget when. Um, you, there can be a storm and I can be inside asleep because my house is sturdy. And so if your house is on the rock, it doesn't mean storms don't come your way. It means that the storms don't shake you. You don't have to be stressed out and full of fear. When a storm comes your way, you're like, I'm fine. I'm indoors. A lot of Christians stand on the roof of their house, right? It's like, there's a storm coming. They're like, ah, Jesus, save me, save me, save me. And he's like, go indoors, right? Just, I'm telling you what to do. It's that simple. Don't say not stand on your roof. Just go inside. You can be watching TV, playing video games, eating dinner, you know, uh, reading bedtime stories to your kids, and there could be a big storm outside. It doesn't even bother you if your house is sturdy. So the way your house is sturdy is by hearing what Jesus says and believing Him and then and walking accordingly. So being a doer of the Word it was number eight. Number nine is know where you are. Um, wow, I'm going too fast, I think. I think I'm going to have, uh-oh, I'm going to have way too many questions to answer. <laughs> anyway, so number nine, know where you are. What do I mean by this? You are not in the storm, right? Usually stress is called, stress, fear is called, caused by being in a storm. You're not actually in the storm. 
Right? Ephesians 2, verses 6 and 7 says, um, God raised us up together and made us sit together in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The real you is seated with Christ right now. If you're born again, your spirit is with Jesus right now on the throne. That's where you are. You are safe. It's kind of like you're playing a video game. You're see- sitting there with Jesus, and then what's happening in the natural world isn't the real you. It's not the full picture, right? You're not, if I'm playing a video game and something happens to my character, I don't, get, I don't freak out. Say, so, oh, I'll try again. I'll try again. And that's what it can be like, right? Maybe if Jesus is sitting next to me, I'll be like, can you pass this level for me? It's too hard for me. And that's how the relationship can be, where you say, I'm totally fine. I don't need to be afraid because the real me is safe. Because honestly, even if you die in this world, you just instantly are in the presence of God. Because in your spirit, you already are. It is right now, it's very similar to playing a video game in that sense of, okay, there's situations I need to resolve. I need to walk, you know, in power and, and love and grace and things. And I need to change things and all that. But the real me isn't actually in the storm. The real me is in heaven, right? That's why Jesus could be asleep in the boat, right? Because the real him wasn't in the storm. He had authority. He had a spirit of power. He knew he could stop it if he wanted to, so he wasn't afraid. You know, he was walking in humility. He knew it was, it was God, not natural strength. And so if you know where you are, the real you is, then the stress will just melt away, right? The fear will just melt away when you say, that's not the real me. I'm safe. I'm sound. Um, no, no one can steal me from God's hands, right? Nothing can, can take me away from God. I'm safe with him. And it just changes our perspective. We say, yeah, I'd still like to solve this issue, but I'm doing it from a position of strength and peace and safety instead of doing it from, from fear. So you're not in the storm. And number 10 is uh, wisdom and understanding. So wisdom and understanding can set you free from stress and fear. And this one, I, um, this is the longest one, actually. So Proverbs 2, verse 11 says, discretion will preserve you. Understanding will keep you. And there's dozens of verses I could have used right here, but understanding will keep you. If we understand why we're stressed in the first place, that can set us free where we say, you know what, I'm just going to solve this problem. And so I want to explain here a little bit. Um, you know, if you understand the cause of stress, you can walk in freedom from it. You can prevent it. You can solve it. Things like that. See, one of the reasons for stress is unclear priorities. If you don't know what you're committed to at what level, then life can be very stressful because you'll try to do everything and then you, you won't be able to do everything and you'll never know, okay, I can't get it all done. So what do I do? What do I not do? And it can cause stress when you just don't know why you're doing what you're doing. So imagine a, a few examples for this. Imagine that at your house, you have eight glasses, eight plates, eight bowls, eight forks, eight knives, right? Eight of all of the dishes and stuff like that. And you might say, I run out too quickly. So then you buy 16 and you're like, oh, this is much better. Now I don't have to do the dishes as much. But then you say, now I'm going to buy 24. Now I'm going to buy 32. Now I'm going to buy 100. Right? At some point, you're like, okay, now the kitchen's always dirty because I have too many dishes. My, my cabinet can only hold 20, and I have 32. And so it's like, okay, I bought so many. Now they're everywhere, and everything's a mess. See, more of a good thing can actually become a bad thing. If you try to squeeze in more things than actually fit, then it makes everything worse. And I'll give a few different examples for this, right? Imagine trying to pack a suitcase, right? And you try to pack everything in it. And I'm sure all of us, if you've ever traveled, you've probably been in this boat, right? Where you're like jumping on the suitcase, trying to squish it down, trying to get the zipper to go. But if you refuse to take something out of it, if it's just about to burst and you get the zipper done and then the the whole suitcase breaks, right? Now you can't, now you can't use a suitcase at all. See, if you try to, and and again, that's actually a literal form of stress. You're stressing the container. You're stressing the cabinet. You're stressing the suitcase. If you try to squeeze things in and see the reason why people try and do that is because if you don't have clear priorities, you're like, I can't take anything out. I want all of it. But if you know your priorities, you can say, this is my top priority. That's my next one. That's my next one. That's my next one. So you'll say, I don't like it, but I know exactly what to remove. I know exactly what to remove to, to get this done, right? I can fit 20 glasses. I only want 20 glasses. I can only fit this many outfits and this many things for my suitcase, then I'll cut out the ones that are lower priority. So that's a very simple example, but people do this stuff stuff all the time unintentionally, right? We do it with our time. We do it with our money. We do it with our focus. I want to focus on too many things. Well, guess what? Now you're not focused on anything. Your social life, your hobbies, there's so many ways that we unintentionally stress ourselves out by trying to pursue everything and not knowing priorities and saying no to some things, right? One of the keys to freedom from stress is is being able to say no to things. And you can't say no to things 
unless you know what your priorities are. So for example, if you have $100, but you want to spend $200, that's stressful. If you go ahead and do it, now you're in debt. Now it's another form of stress. You're stressing out your account. If you only have 24 hours in a day, which you do, except for a couple days ago, <laughs> uh, daylight, or daylight savings, is uh, if you have 24 hours in a day and you want to do 30 hours worth of stuff, you'll be stressed out because it just won't work. You can try and try and try all you want and then you'll start sacrificing your sleep and sacrificing family time and, sac and now your whole day got worse because you tried to cram so much in there and you didn't say no to anything. If you have 20 friends and you want to be best friends with all of them, but you only have time for five, that's going to be stressful. Now you're actually a bad friend to all of them. If you don't say, you know what, I'm just going to, this is my inner circle that I have time for. I can't be best friends with everybody. So if you never say no to things, that can be very stressful because it's easy to want more than we can handle. It's easy to want to buy something you can't afford. It's easy to want to do. If, if the days lasted 48 hours, I would still run out of time. There's so many things I want to do in a day. Like I'd want to spend 10 hours doing this, 10 hours doing that, 10 hours doing the other. You, you can, it's easy to want more. We have to know our priorities so we can say no. Um, again, freedom from stress is often tied to that wisdom and understanding saying, here are my priorities. This is what I'm going to say no to. And then it, everything simplifies. And so that was number 10 is wisdom and, and um, understanding can actually help us walk in freedom from stress because we can just solve the problem. We just don't try to do everything. We just say no to certain things and say, you know what, if I have $100 and I want to buy four things that cost $50 each, which is my number one most important? Which is my number two most important? Okay, three and four, sorry, maybe someday, but I'm only going to do these and I'm going to enjoy it. And then you're not stressed out. You say, I made a tough call, but I know what I'm committed to, so I chose the ones that are most important to me. And now I spent a hundred, I had a hundred, I'm happy. You know, and so a lot of times people cram too much in and if you just start chopping some things out of your life that shouldn't be there, right? If you say, I want to follow God with all my heart and I want that circle of friends that's dragging me down. I want both. And it's like, you can only have one or the other. If you try to have both, you won't get either. You know, you'll, in any way. So uh, one of the keys is to start chopping things out and that comes from wisdom and understanding. So those are the 10. I hope that's helpful. Again, life does not have to be stressful. God did not design us to be stressed out all the time, and He doesn't even need all of His power to set us free. Any one of these nuggets I've shared is more than enough to walk in freedom from stress and from fear. That's how awesome God is, is that you don't have to have perfect victory in every single area to never have stress. You just need one area of victory, and that's more than enough. And I'd say maybe pick one or two that you liked and focus on those. Or, you know, if, if you see one, you're like, oh, that's one I always go with. Maybe try a different one. Maybe say, I always try that one. Maybe I'll try one of these other ones and see how that, uh, how that goes. I'm just going to really focus on this revelation of God's love. Or I'm just going to start asking God. Or I'm going to start um, walking in more wisdom and understanding. Again, all 10 are great, but just pick one. Start with one. Uh, listen to this again uh, 10 times and pick another one. So anyway, I'm going I'm to move on to the Q&A now. We'll see how this goes. By the way, for those of you, I've heard that some of you are wondering um, why we do so many reruns lately. And uh, it's because we have some construction going on and also we were having a hard time finding hosts. And so as you can see right now, I have no host. And so um, as we're growing and people are getting busy with different tasks, we're going to try out um, doing this without hosts um, in order to avoid reruns. And so uh, I'm excited to spend uh, more time with you all. That's why I'll be here tonight and tomorrow. And so uh, it's much easier to find one person who's available than two people who are available. Um, so anyway, we'll see how this goes. Uh, I might ask some questions that normally, anyway, we'll see what happens, okay? So, uh, first question is by Mr. Coffee on YouTube. Uh, is that German or just kidding? So, what about when you feel stress and mental tension for no reason? When there's no difficult situation, but the feeling of stress and not being able to relax is still there? That is a really good question. So, if there's no reason for it, um, there's still some reason, right? I mean, whether it's uh, you didn't get enough sleep or you drank too much coffee or, right? Sometimes it could be a biological thing that's going on. And that's where I'd say, okay, God, um, let, let me pick some of these, right? So wisdom, understanding, is there anything that I'm doing that I could do different? Is there any wisdom for this? But also I'd go to, right, asking God for peace, right? The one I mentioned there is just asking God, saying, God, I don't know why my brain won't stop working, right? If someone's struggling with insomnia or something like that, it's be like, I know this isn't from you, so... Um, I ask for your grace, you know, I'm just asking for peace. And if there's anything that I can do differently, show me. If there's anything I need to be set free from, show me that. If I need to be healed of anything, um, then thank you that I'm healed in Jesus' name. And so there doesn't have to be a reason you understand. 
but there is a reason, right? Whether it's subconscious or physical or whatever it is. And so God can overcome it no matter what it is, whether it's a reason you understand or not. It doesn't always have to be a problem to solve right in front of you. Uh, maybe that is the problem, right? Maybe it's like, I just can't stop thinking. I just can't turn off this thought. I can't stop having um, this dream or maybe, you know, um, yeah, you wake up in the middle of the night and, you know, whatever it may be. Now, to me, if I ever notice I have thoughts that I don't like, I try to figure, I try to go into detective mode and say, where'd that come from, right? Why, why do I not have the same peace in my heart, peace in my, in my mind, whatever it is? And, and sometimes I ask God to show me so I can change something. Other times it's like, I don't understand. I don't need to understand. Um, I just want to be free from it. You know, I don't have to. God's not limited to our understanding unless we limit him to our understanding. I like to let God do things beyond what I understand. And sometimes he'll explain it to me and sometimes he won't, but I still am just happy to receive it either way. So I hope that helps. That was a very good question. Um, let's see. So uh, uh, I'll go ahead and ask this. Uh, yeah. So one question here, I guess this is, uh, um, anyway, do you believe America's at a crossroads? Uh, this is anonymous. Um, it seems like culture is going so woke. Um, that's a good question. Are we at a crossroads? Um, I think that we're always at a crossroads. I mean, it seems like every single generation, and, and it's not like generations are a set in stone thing, right? Every single person has opportunities to make choices. And so if you look through history, there's always choices. Now, it's, it does seem like the choices are getting more extreme, where people, you know, people are going more one way, more another way, right? Left is going more left, right's going more right, conservatives going more, you know, so you see more extremes. But this is all just reflections of past choices other people have made and past choices other people have made. And so I think we're always at a crossroads. I mean, it's easy to say, you know, this generation definitely is the last one, right? But I feel like every generation has felt that way probably. I mean, think about ancient Rome where people are being burnt as human candles. I don't think we're that bad yet. And so th there's been terrible things and even depends where you live in the world, right? Where some parts of the world are getting very dark, but some have already been very dark. Some are already having terrible wars and terrible things happening. So I would say uh, um, I believe that we're always at a crossroads, but, but more to what you're trying to get at is uh, I do believe that, that we're, at, we're at a crucial time. You know, we're, we're, it's, it's always crucial, but it seems like the stakes are getting higher, that people are more open about their agendas and about the directions they want to go. You know, people have different goals they're trying to achieve and they're more open about it. Back in the day, it seems like people tried to at least say the right thing, even if they didn't mean it. it seems like now people are just openly saying like, we're pro evil. Okay, that's weird. Uh, so it is an interesting time. And to me, that's, uh, you know, okay, God, how can, what do you, what do you call me to do? What's our, what's our role to do in this? I, we shouldn't just sit back and be spectators. We should say, what's my calling? Because you being exactly who God created you to be is the best thing you can do for this generation. Right? And that's always true, is that God knew when you would be alive. He put you in this world for such a time as this. And so what he wants to, to pour through you into this world is exactly what he wants you to pour into the world through you. And the, the, body is a big, the body of Christ is a very big body. Not everyone has to do the exact same thing. So find what am I called to do and focus on that. And, and by being light, we can, we can uh, bring more light back in. Right? The light and the salt, they prevent the darkness and the rot. Right? Where the salt of the earth, salt prevents, it slows down the rot. It doesn't stop it. This world's going to burn someday no matter what we do. But um, our role is to bring more light and life into it to slow down the destruction. And, and, and be encouraged. People are getting born again every day. Right? And so as long as people are getting born again, to me, things are good. Right? More, more people into the kingdom. So let's see here. Um, ooh, uh, mm -hmm. Long question, so I'll, I'll just go for it. Denise on YouTube is uh, long in the sense that I can't read it silently to myself in advance. So Denise on YouTube, why is it that there are some days where we wake up 100% sure of God's promise and will in our lives and other days we wake up unsure and even feeling like it not, might not be? Um, so some days you wake up sure, some days you wake up not sure. Is this just something that all believers deal with? Would humbling ourselves and by putting f our faith above our feelings and countering those emotions with his love and word help? Um, yes, I would say that the temptation is always there for people, but not everyone has to walk like this. Uh, I, uh, I can't remember the last time I woke up feeling like I wasn't sure about what God's called me to do. I know that in the past I used to get discouraged very easily because when you have big dreams, um, if people have no dreams, no expectations, it's very easy to, to never be disappointed, to never be tempted with discouragement. But I had such big dreams of what God was calling me to do with my life 
that it was easy to get discouraged if I didn't see things playing out the way I thought they would or in things like that. And so uh, many times when you want more, when you say, I want everything God has for me, you can be tempted with discouragement or, you know, giving up or things like that. And that's why it says faith with patience, right? They go hand in hand as if you truly believe, then you won't stop believing just because it doesn't happen when you thought it would happen. And so I would say exactly what you have right there. Um, I would say every believer, uh, the enemy throws darts at everybody, right? So you can have random thoughts where you're like, that was not me. I don't know where that came from. That was not me. That thought was not from God. That was not from the real me. And so I'm not going to, I'm not going to, I'm not going to think about it anymore. That's, I reject that thought. Um, and so the enemy throws darts at everybody. There's temptation for everybody, but you do not have to live life always waffling back and forth. Um, you can be free from that. And again, I, like you said, I would say uh, humbling yourself, you know, saying, you know what, I'm going to receive what God has for me. I want to walk in grace. I want to sow the word into my heart. I want to change my focus. And to me, I like to do this conversationally with God. Is there anything I'm believing that, I, that I'm wrong about? Is there any lie that I believe that I should be set free from? Is there anything that I don't know about that you want to show me? And asking God questions. To me, God's not sitting there grading me. He's my coach slash teacher slash cheerleader where he's trying to help me learn these things. And so I can go to him. The Holy Spirit can teach you all things, spending time in the word. He can direct you toward uh, teachings or other things. Sometimes I've had God lead me toward movies. It's like God just puts on my heart to watch a movie. And through that movie, he does something in me or he sparks or inspires something in me that, that shows me something that he had on his heart for me. So um, ask God questions and say, why do I keep waffling? Is there something I'm not committed to? Is there something I'm believing that I shouldn't be believing? That's not true. Um, is there anything I don't know yet? So it's a great question. And I just encourage you, uh, yeah, if you're still in doubt, if you keep waffling, just ask God why and uh, have those conversations with him. Say, journal your thoughts. To me, that's a very, uh, I, I could talk about that for hours, is the power of journaling. Because the moment you write something down, you can look at it. And once you look at it, it confusion, lies, lies thrive when there's confusion. And so if you don't know your thoughts very well and it's kind of vague, it can have more power over you. If you write it down, you look at it and say, oh, well, that's a lie. And now it has zero power because lies are only powerful if they can trick you. The moment you know it's a lie, it's the easiest thing in the world to let go of. So uh, that's one thing that uh, that's just a practical tip that may or may not work, work for you is write things down because it says taking your thoughts captive. It's easier to take your thoughts captive if you write them down, look at them and say that is not from God. I reject that and move on. So uh, let's see here. Um, let's see. Yeah. So AK on YouTube is how do you apply this in a practical sense? My kids schedule so crazy. I feel like I'm never at home to do chores. So this is where, again, I can't give you a specific answer since I don't know your exact situation. But to me, this goes to that very last one I talked about, right? Trying to squeeze too many things into a suitcase and saying it's about to burst. And so to me, it's focusing on, okay, what are my priorities? What do I care about most? And I do see this, this, uh, uh, I won't say trap necessarily, but this, uh, uh, it's easy to fall into this is we want to do the best for our kids. We want to do the best for our spouse, all these different things. And we assume more is always better, but more is not always better. So to me, if you look at priorities and say, what are the main priorities? What can we fit? And we have to cut a few things. You know, so sometimes you have to make the difficult decisions to say, I'm going to cut that out. I'm going to cut that out. Right. So to me, like if, uh, you know, when my kids are older, say if they all have three different hobbies outside of the house and I realize, you know what? I never see them anymore. And they're all having fun and, and it's good for them, right? One's learning music, one's playing a sport, whatever. And I say, but, but our, as a family, we're becoming roommates. And I believe that it's, a, it's higher priority to me that we be a strong family. That's a loving family that we are, are, have a bond together. And say, so, you know what? We're going to chop some things out. And so those can be diff difficult conversations, difficult um, um, processes. But when you know your priorities, then that, that gives you the courage to say, I've got to cut that out. Even though I love it, I'm going to cut that out. Like I used to love playing video games. I still do. I just hardly ever do it uh, because I, I still love them as much as I ever did. But I love other things more. And so it's like, you know what? I'm not, I don't love them more than my wife. I don't love them more than my kids. And so now I prioritize them. I had to chop some things out of my life because if I still played games as much as I used to, then, then I'd be messing up all my priorities. And so uh, it's a great question. Again, very practical to me. This is very, this is where it kind of gets real, right? When do I clean? When do I take care of the kids? When do I do fun stuff? When do all these things? That's where you kind of got to write stuff down. What am I doing? And get the red pen and say, I have got to cut something or trim some things down. Or maybe instead of every day, this is once a week. 
you know, like I'd love to watch three movies every night. I can't do that. And so it's like, okay, I'll watch a movie once a week. I'll watch a 30 minute show in the evening or something, right? So it's just making those tough choices and saying, am I even squeezing in the things I want to squeeze in, right? It's like, how much time do I want to spend doing this? How much time do I want to spend doing that? Because if, you, if, we, if we're too stressed, like I said, is we start to lose things we didn't realize, things we didn't mean to. It's like, whoops, I didn't realize I don't spend time with my spouse anymore. Whoops, I forgot. I haven't been reading my Bible in three months. Things like that. So to me, it's, it's the key is looking at it and saying, I got to chop some things out. So I need to know my priorities and I just got to make the tough call. And uh, God will give you the grace to do that. Just ask him for help. So uh, I thought I'd get to one more, but I, I kept going on and on with my answer. So I hope that this has been a blessing to you. Uh, that's it. I'll see you guys tomorrow morning. If you watch live, it'll be on at 10 a.m. in the morning and I'll see you then. But either way, be blessed. Have an awesome day. Have a good night. Gospel Truth Conference has just been incredible. You can feel the truth coming out, and you can feel your spirit saying, this is the truth. Your spirit, it is united with Christ. They are one. In the spirit realm, you are identical to Jesus, ounce for ounce, molecule for molecule, because it's Jesus living on the inside of you. Join us every weekday for our daily live stream on Gospel Truth TV. 